It's not perfect, but one of the most enduring definitions of religion in sociology comes from the French sociologist Emile Durkheim. You see, for Durkheim, religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. Now, these beliefs and practices bring together its adherents into one single moral community. Looking closely at this definition, we find that there are two elements here, at least two elements. The one, one element has to do with sacred things, beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. From the point of view of sociology, sacred things are forbidden things. You can't touch them, you can't access them, you can't even enter these spaces, especially without having undergone proper rituals. We're going to come back to sacred things towards the end of my lecture. The other element has to do with solidarity. You see, from the point of view of Durkheim, these beliefs and practices bring people into one single moral community. There is a function, in other words, the formation of solidarity. And that is exactly what makes Durkheim's definition quite unique compared to other definitions of religion. You see, other definitions of religion place an emphasis on belief in the supernatural, belief in God, belief in angels, even belief in the afterlife, belief in the transcendent. You don't find any of that in Durkheim's definition. That's why you can argue that Durkheim's definition is inherently functionalist. The function of religion is to bring people into one single moral community. Therefore, Religion is not only a marker of who we are, it brings us, it has the power to bring us together in concrete ways. Many of us Filipinos will resonate with this definition. Marami sa atin na makaka-relate. Indeed, Filipinos are, according to global surveys, among the most religious people in the world. Totoo yun. But religion, for the most part, in our experience, is not doctrinal. Hindi siya set of beliefs lang. In a concrete manner, think about it. Religion, through rituals, fiestas, fellowships, Bible studies, small groups, religion brings us together. This is why, kapag tinanong natin ng mga Pilipino, bakit niyo po ginagawa yan? Ang sagot natin parati ay nakagis na kasi namin yan. Kaya lang po ito nagsimula, hindi namin alam. Ganyan na talaga yan. Precisely because we are socialized into the practices of religion, not always the beliefs, not always the doctrines. In a way, tama si Durkheim. The thing, though, is that how far can we go with this definition? You see, in my many years of experience as a sociologist of religion, I have encountered through my research, my teaching, my public engagement in writings, many instances in which people would tell me about the wounds religion has inflicted on them. In other words, hindi sila nasasama dun sa solidarity that Durkheim was talking about, but instead, this exact same institution, phenomenon, pushes them away. From a sociological perspective, this is expected as well. The fact that religion unites people into one moral community also means that it is a boundary marker. Us versus them. And in many cases, those who no longer subscribe to these unified systems of beliefs and practices of that specific community are gradually eased out for being different or deviant. I think some of you can relate. The reality, therefore, is that the solidarity we find in religion is a double-edged sword. For those who are sold to it, Religion is a sacred canopy. It's a worldview. It's a way of life through which everything in life makes sense. Dun sa nakaka-relate. But for those who can't fully embrace it, they are in many ways treated differently. They're wounded. Truth be told, many of us would rather turn a blind eye to such wounds, to such divisions. This is why I feel that you and I need to have a conversation about exactly this thing. So today, let's unpack this thing with the following questions. Why do religions divide? How do these divisions manifest? And is there anything that we can do 
when the faith we hold dear hurts us. How does religion hurt us? Well, the usual suspect, obviously, would be violent extremism. Ano ba yung violent extremism? Physical violence waged in the name of religion. We find this all over the place. Physical violence. But as a sociologist, I would like to pay more attention to the insidious ways, yung hindi halata na mga kaparaanan in which religion causes pain. I will focus on two. Yung una, I will focus on attitudes about religion and religious difference. Yung pangalawa naman, I will focus on religious claims over the Philippine nation. Isa-isahin natin. The first, attitudes about religion and religious difference. Hahango ako sa isang recent study that I conducted with another sociologist on religious diversity in the Philippines. Galing ito sa isang national survey na ginawa ng International Social Survey Program. May, they had a module on religion and this was administered not too long ago. Ano yung mga findings namin doon? Apparently, it turns out that two-thirds of Filipinos believe that, listen carefully, religions bring more conflict than peace. That's counterintuitive. Nagdadala ng conflict instead ng kapayapaan ang religion. Two-thirds of Filipinos. And, and there's another counterintuitive finding. Almost half of Filipinos believe that people with very religious beliefs are intolerant of others. Can you imagine? Almost half of Filipinos believe na kapag the more religious you are, the more intolerant you are of other people. Conflict? Intolerance? Wow! What do these figures tell us? A lot of things, really. The first is that many Filipinos are aware that being religious is not something to celebrate. That's counterintuitive. I began this lecture by talking about the rituals and the festivals and the things that bind us people, bind people together. But for many Filipinos, apparently, religion has the tendency to hurt people. There's nothing to celebrate. And so, where does it come from? Saan galing ito? I suspect it has to do with our daily experiences. You see, our understanding of religion is not abstract. It's not catechetical, if you will. It's personal. Religion is mediated to us through our daily encounters with religious people. Paano ba nila tratuhin ang mga tao na iba ang convictions? Consistent ba sila yung kanilang paniniwala dun sa kanilang mga kagawian? Paano nila ituring yung mga taong naghihirap or yung mga sexual minorities, ang mga LGBT? Those are the things that tell us whether there's sincerity to that faith or not. The second has to do with the claims of a religion over the nation. Kanina attitudes. This time, I want to go macro. Let's focus on paano ba tinuturing ng religion ang bansa natin. You see, some scholars have terms for this already. Religious nationalism, Christian nationalism, and in my own work, I call it theological nationalism. There are fine differences among these concepts, but perhaps the common denominator is that they all recognize the totalizing claim religion makes over national identity. In our case, the claim is that the Philippines is a Christian nation. Isa daw tayong Kristiyanong bansa. You find it in the media, you find it in journalistic reports, you find it uh, in your classrooms, you find it in your textbooks. We're a Christian nation. But the implication on politics, elections, and policy making, it's very, very clear. Listen, because the Philippines is a conservative Christian nation, social and political order cannot go against what that faith teaches. I'll give you some examples. Para sa akin, yung sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, the move for what we call soji equality. It has been called many names, to be honest. Sinful, evil, and even a form of Western colonization that will destroy, sabi nila, the moral fabric of the Filipino nation. In fact, in my own research with another colleague, 
religious freedom has also been invoked by the majority to protect the interest of this imagined conservative majority. Fundamentalism, if you think about it, rejects the dignity and presence of sexual minorities because they are considered sinful, evil, and destructive of the moral fiber of our nation. Insidious, and yet it's there. Is there anything that we can do? For starters, we need to move beyond religious tolerance. Uso uso yan, religious tolerance. But to be honest, religious tolerance is not enough for me because it has no drive to interact with other people. To tolerate mo lang eh. I hope we can take advantage of the religious diversities we find in our communities, in our classrooms, in our neighborhoods, in whatever communities that we're part of, I bet that you would find people of other faiths in exactly that same community. There is a concept in sociology and religious studies right now called covenantal pluralism. It is asking us to respect one another even if we disagree over each other's beliefs and practices. In other words, we do not have to agree. Hindi natin kinakailangan mag-agree with one another. But our disagreement over these beliefs and practices should not stop us from recognizing each other's dignity and allowing one another our place in society. This means, concretely, that discrimination based on religion, religious differences, or even non-religion is unacceptable. In many ways, covenantal pluralism is asking us to engage in interfaith conversations. I feel, however, that there, are, there is another type of conversation that might be far more important. And what is it? Intra-faith conversations. Conversations that take place within our religious communities. Why? Religious institutions, from a Durkheimian perspective, are spaces of solidarity. But as spaces of solidarity, they also become echo chambers themselves. This is why, for those people who belong to those communities, it is difficult for them to see the other side. Let alone the wounds their own people are hiding from everyone else. Because you're assuming that there is a unified system of beliefs and practices. Unified. And in many cases, defined as uniform. Intra-faith conversations challenge us to confront our own internal differences as well. It's time that we confronted our diverse views in our own parishes and congregations and communities and learned from one another. Again, uniformity is not the goal, but understanding. Divorce, domestic violence, gender equality, and whether religious communities should stand against authoritarianism are some of the hot-button issues upon which reflexive Religious viewpoints have a lot to say. Intrafaith conversations. As I now conclude, what lessons can we pick up from covenantal pluralism and intrafaith conversations? You see, to be sure, religion has inflicted wounds on many of us or other people for one reason or another. You might, in fact, have wounds that you're harboring yourself. There's no denying that in the long history of religion, and in our own experience of religion, religious institutions have become tools for the enslavement of people. But if religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, I propose to you that innate to that sacredness is the desire for freedom. How do I know this? It's there in religious language itself. Depending on your tradition, you may call it enlightenment, completeness, salvation, or even redemption. Whatever religious or theological language you might subscribe to, you find in it 
the deep aspiration of humanity for liberty. Kalayaan. In the final analysis, the faith that we hold dear may have inflicted wounds on many of us, but there is too in religion that rejects all this violence. Perhaps muffled, perhaps delivered in a still small voice, either way, that voice musters all the courage to say that injustices have to go. And so, people of faith and allies of faith, it's time that we said no to every form of injustice and suffering that religion has inflicted on us. Let us reclaim every space and every conversation in the name of what could perhaps be the most sacred of all things, freedom. Thank you.